So I'm the founder and chairman of a company called Seventh Level. And what we do is we help sales professionals, coaches, sales managers, executives, business owners, entrepreneurs, really transform the way they communicate, the way they sell with learning specific questions, what we know, what we call neuroemotional persuasion questions with the right tonality, the right pausing that put your prospects at ease and eliminates sales pressure from that conversation, eliminates the resistance and actually get your prospects to persuade themselves. So my guest tonight, I've been waiting for this. He's one of our top five students that have ever gone through NEPQ. One of our top five, okay? So we have thousands of students like this. Marco is in the top five. Okay, so Marco, first of all, tell us, I know you live in Australia, so it's like one in the afternoon. You're, I think you're still locked down down there. Like, can you even leave your house or what are you doing out there? No, we, we, we can leave now. It's been a week. They kind of let us free, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so for the past eight months, you've just, no wonder yeah. you're selling so much. You have no time to do anything else. You just stay in your room and sell all day. That's the secret. They got to put you in lockdown. They and, just got to put you in lockdown. Yeah, and they got to get you the NPQ, both. Come That's with, right. Come all right, so you're in lockdown, you're in Australia for the last eight months, but where are you actually from? You don't sound like you have an Aussie accent. No, originally from Italy, but I moved in Australia when I was 19. So. Okay, so you're from Italy. What part? I've been to Italy many times. Rome. 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 Yeah. I've been there a few times. I love it. All right, so perfect. So let's do this. Let's get into this. How did you get involved in sales? Like, what was your first sales job? What was it like? Like, what, what did you actually do to get involved in sales? How did you learn all these skills? So the first sales job I had was a door to door at 15 years old. Okay. Since then, I've just sold pretty much. It's a tough job. Uh, I used to sell electricity contracts. Uh, and yeah, it was definitely a tough experience, especially the way I always started. Yeah. But, uh, at, at that at that time, really kind of, uh, especially the first two weeks that right. I went through the job, I really understood that there is a structure to it because I remember that that's funny because the third door that I knocked, a guy actually threw me a piece of wood and that kind of made me realize like this is going to be a tough couple of years. It I, wasn't as easy as they told it was going door to door and you've got homeowners like throwing sticks at you to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah, it was really, really hard. It was really, really hard to the way how it was set up. So they just like yeah. get, get a gas in a van, drop there. I was like, hey, go, just go for it. Okay, so you started off door to door. You're young. You're like, okay, there's got to be something to this. So um, what were what was selling like for you, I guess, that first year? Was average, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would say... Um, scraping buys will be doing the 2k to the 4k a month but really really scraping by okay so how many hours were you working to do that i've got a strong work ethic so i was putting 10 hours but i still remember the heat and the shoes and that's kind of moment <laughs> right the, the exhausted leg going door to door yeah. yeah that's i mean i started my sales career door to door as well definitely exhausting what type of sales training were you going through at that time you're younger like who were you learning from what was that like the first person that I got kind of attracted to was Brian Tracy. Okay. But what I did after I bought the Cardone University, that was at the end of my first year because I was like, I have to be able to learn something. Yeah. And that kind of, uh, that kind of is the first thing that I approached. Okay. So you started learning Brian Tracy, the Phil Felt found. I'm actually pretty good friends with Brian. We did, uh, when I launched the company three years ago, we did a product together called the Ultimate Closers Masterclass, which you of course have, have gone through. Brian's a, Brian's a good guy, uh, sold a long time ago, but he's great. Um, you started selling that way. Like when you were selling that way, what type of results were you getting from that? Like what was selling like for you mentally? Let's say, when I when I approached the Cardone way, so I, I was really indecisive, and and the indecision was like right because Terry Brentis is more like calm and 
And so yeah. granted, I was like, oh, I need to push you away because I need to grab this out, which is completely the wrong way, the, how, the way how I was wired around because I was like, I was like, yeah, it's going to get me the cell. But after the, the 10 hours day, they went from like five. You can't really be combative for so long. Yeah. So you were selling door to door. So it's more of a transactional sale, right? It's yeah. a cheaper product. I think you were selling like internet services or something like that, right? Yeah. So basically, it's a cheaper product. So you can get away a little bit of that stuff. Not, not great. But I'm assuming you probably had a lot of people after you left that maybe canceled. Pulled out, yeah. That, that that was the main thing. It's like you can get you can get ten people. Let's say on on good days, I used to get like three or four people a day because yeah. I got started getting results. But it was like a fake results because I was like four people two pulled out because they had a thirty. They have they have a weekly a week enough period. Yeah. Uh, and since the guy was coming and install things and everything, and that was like a fake rewarding. I was like, yeah, it was the sell at the end of the week. I was looking at the paycheck. I was like, oh, what is half of that? <laughs> You had this high because you made a sale or made a couple of sales, but then you went to bed at that night and what was going on in your mind? Because I've been in your shoes when I first started learning how to sell that way. As I was developing NBQ, I would go to bed on the weekends and I'm like, man, you know, it felt good. I made those sales Friday and Saturday, but I knew by Monday that probably 30, 40, 50% of them would be gone. So it's like the shrieking feeling I always had. What was going on in your mind? Doubt. A lot of self-doubt. I was like... Well, maybe it's not a job for me. Maybe yeah. it's like, maybe it's like, maybe I'm not target for do this. Maybe I should do another kind of job. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, the burn, the burnout. So that's the thing yeah. because also I was tired mentally. That gets you tired mentally. Yeah, it kind of mentally beats up. Now you you got out of that. You eventually started working with Matt Ryder, who's one of my top five students as well. You know, I trained Matt about nine months ago, some somewhere in that range, 10 months ago or somewhere in that range. And so Matt, how did this, how did it happen? So I started training Matt, Matt started really, really crushing it. Right. And then what happened? Like, how did you get introduced from the, from Matt for the training that we were doing here with NEPQ? Yeah. So I, I used to work for Matt, which is one of my other mentors as well. And yeah. It totally changed my life but so i i saw i saw his transition of like going from like is like 10 to 15 k a month to 30 to, to like eat like in, in 30 days yeah and i was like dude what's going on there like yeah he was like no you know i i met this guy is jeremy minor and he has a different approach he's like more a science approach to it yeah. like i think you should do it and that the rest is like yeah so sort of matt obviously came in he was already making fifteen thousand a month doing really well but automatic i mean within 30 days he he like doubled his income he went to thirty thousand a month and then like two months later he's at fifty thousand a month and then like six months later he's averaging a hundred thousand a month straight commission 1099 salesperson so you get involved in nepq 2.0 right what started changing for you that well first of all before nepq what type of income were you actually making? I would say between uh, I was between the ten to the fifteen k. See, so, and that's really good, right? And a uh, lot of salespeople that start making ten to fifteen thousand feel like they've arrived. That mm -hmm. I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. I can't learn anything else. Like I am the god of sales. I make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So why at that point, when you're making one hundred and fifty thousand a year, did you get in your mind that Maybe I should learn more advanced training to increase income. Like, what caused that in your mind to think that that was even possible? Two two things. Number one is seeing the results of Matt uh, and knowing what he was going through prior when he's a lot of stress, a lot of like burning out, feeling like exhausted, to like completely doing like six days, six to seven days a week. It's like, ah, oh, I can do it every day, not an issue. And the second is the fact that if you're a sales guy, there is an element of out learning everybody or out learning yourself in the previous month. Yeah. And that's something that you actually teach me along the way. And it's something that is going to be for me for my life. And yeah. I knew that there was something different to it because what we, what we done prior wasn't really kind of made of any kind of structure, you know, it was just told by other people that they, you have to do it. You have to put an agenda. You have to do that. You have to do the frame or whatever. Yeah. You know, I know you sold like business coaching to like business owners and stuff like that. So you'd frame them like, 
hey, you know, the, the purpose of this call and at the end of the call, it's going to, you know, make sure that you make an educated decision or if it's going to be the right fit for you, right? It's what you're taught to do and it can get you to a certain income level, you know, 10, 15 grand a month. I've, I've even seen some people make as high as 20 grand a month doing it that way in, in different industries. So you get in, uh, how did it start changing for you that first 30 days that, you know, the second month when you started to go through NPQ, like what were some of the changes that were happening? Let me tell you as well, like the decision wasn't easy. Okay. When I approached that decision, it wasn't easy, but okay. I decided to take the faith and the re repay in the first 30 days because I went completely from uh, the 15K to the 45K in the first month. And the aspect was that I didn't have not even one person putting out of the product. And mm -hmm. I've actually heard that. And I almost was like, wow, that's like really quick. Because typically, you know, students that I train, it takes them, you know, three, four months to really like, you know, triple or so, something like that. When I heard you'd done it like in 30 or 45 days, I was actually really astounded. I, and I think that was really awesome that you did. Um, how did it change for your prospects that you were talking to, though? Yeah, because like that is like you're going from perfect. I sold that person. That's it which you're going to build in a relation. So that is when the word network in selling is key because if mm -hmm. you try to prove your customers become like your friends. Yeah. And that is like your network expands. So you start getting more sales anyway, because people yeah. start respecting you as a trusted advisor, but for real, not yeah. because you pull yourself. So <laughs> different. Yeah. Because they, they feel different, right? So they, they, they look at you as more of the expert, more of the authority, because of your questioning skills, basically position you as the authority. I mean, the, the questions position you as that authority or their expert. And if you don't know those questions, they just view you as like a, a typical salesperson that's just trying to stuff your solution down their throat. And then they commoditize you. And you never want to be commoditized because then you're, then you're competing on price. Um, let's talk about this. So you're in an EPQ 2.0. You're obviously doing well. You more than doubled your income within the first couple of months. And then I know you came to us and you're like, hey, I want more advanced training. Like I need to tie in NEPQ to what I sell. There's still questions I don't understand. I'm still messing up here and there. I, I remember you saying like, I feel like I could make more money. I just don't know what I don't know, right? What caused you at that point? Because you had more than doubled your income. Mm -hmm. So you're making 30, 40,000 a month from 15. That's a big payday raise. I mean, for most people, like they're just going to stop there. Like, Hey, I'm rich. I'm, I'm a Donald Trump. I'm going to retire. I'm a billionaire or whatever. But what caused you to then be like, I want more advanced training from Jeremy than just any PQ. Yeah. Because I wanted to be the top 1%. Mm. In that case, if you want to be a top 1%, that's the aspect that you have to take. There is a level up to it. And you have to be able to get there by being trained because technically it's not going to come by wasting money towards leads and you no, know, and just trying to train on them and stuff like that. But there is a level of having a script done by a professional, someone mm -hmm. they can do the right tonality. Because yeah. that's the, about trust advisor before. This is just tonality. Plus my accent doesn't help. So there was an aspect of you helped me out. You helped me out to adjust my accent around the tonality of the NBQ. Yeah. So let's talk about the tonality. Like you, it, it, from what I trained you in like the more advanced inner circle where we, you know, we worked with each other on Boxer back and forth on your tonality, you know, write out your sales structure with you in the group sessions, broke down recorded sales calls to really tweak and perfect everything. What was, because your accent's different, right? So if you're calling US-based leads, you're from Italy, right? It would be like me calling Italians in my crazy Arkansas accent. It like wouldn't make any sense, but yet you're still crushing it. So what was it about the tonality training that really took you to that next level? Let's say that we, we I remember the, the moment that we changed the intro, especially when you get skeptical and when you get like curious about the prospect, yeah. that when things start changing because the curiosity is what allowed the prospect to open themselves up rather than you assuming things that you're not seeing. Yeah. So that totally changed. And especially with a hard accent to say something, Especially that creates sales resistance most of the time because people think you're from a call center or stuff like that. Yeah. Using you using the right word, you say just is just that person or it's just like I'm not too sure if you can help me out. That is something that completely helps you out because that 
people space out on what you are and what you're doing. It takes out the sales resistance. So that, you know, I was training this in, in our inner circle group today, you know, Wednesdays we break down their recorded calls, like an hour and a half training. And I talked exactly what we are talking about right now in tonality. And we talked about when in the first 30 to 60 seconds of any sales call, whether it's a cold call, whether it's an inbound lead on your calendar, whether it's an outbound lead that you're calling, whether it's B2B, whether it's B2C, whether it's in person, in face, in a board meeting, on Zoom, it doesn't matter. Your prospects are picking up on social cues based on your tonality and what you are saying and asking that trigger their mind to go one of two ways. One, if you don't know how to do it correctly, it triggers resistance like you talked about. Okay, it triggers resistance, they throw out objections, and they try to get rid of you. What's this all about? Just quote me the price, tell me more. It triggers that by your tonality and what you're saying or asking. Or if you understand NEPQ, like we do, neuroemotional persuasion questions, it actually triggers them and almost forces them to become so curious that they feel like they have to engage. Like they literally have to engage because if they don't engage, it's like a fear of loss of what could be. What are your you thoughts? Know, also, I would say there is an aspect of pre-handling pre objection, which yeah. if you talk about prior, like being burnt out or overcoming objection constantly because you've been pushing, you've been hard, then you're going from overcome like 20 objections a week to possibly five. Yeah. Whereas through asking skill, skill question, and making people understand the consequences of some sort of stuff they don't do it though they, or they keep going to do yeah that they, that is all there so think yeah. pain. it's all about objection prevention right so with any pq you're like you said you're probably preventing 70 75 percent of objections from even happening so i want everybody to imagine in your sales process right now every prospect you talk to if you could eliminate objections by 70 percent like where they don't even have objections. What type of income do you think you'd be making now? Think of all the laydowns you have. Like think about the laydowns that didn't have any objections. The biggest myth that sales trainers tell salespeople, because there's no proof to this. The science completely contradicts this. The data contradicts this. If a sales trainer is saying you to you, that the more objections that prospects are giving you, the more interest they're showing, that is so, well, bullshit. It just doesn't make any sense. The more objections you get, the less likely they are to buy. It just makes logical sense. Think about all the laydown sales you've had. How many objections did you get? Zero. But yet they bought. It was easy, okay? The more objections you get, the less chance they will buy. There's some doubt in their mind where they're basically looking at your product, your service, your solution up here as far more riskier than them just staying in status quo because you don't know how to ask the right questions to create this massive gap in their mind, okay? When you learn an EPQ, you learn to add, how to ask the right questions that create this massive gap in their mind from their current state where they are right now, their situation, present situation, compared to where they want to be. We call that the future state. And what's holding them back from getting there? All these problems and challenges and issues that right. your questions have helped them surface in their mind that they didn't even realize they have. One thing like Marco knows is that most of your prospects, when you first talk to them, don't even realize they have a problem. Or maybe they know they have a problem, but they don't know how bad it really is. Or maybe they know they have a problem, but maybe they don't know how bad it could be if they don't do anything about it. Like, what are the consequences to that? That's exactly right. And there is an element of if everyone is can go and check what persuasion really is in science okay mm -hmm. it's not pushing people to do things they don't want to do is make them convince that changing is the right option to do and that's what NPQ stand for yeah you're, you're right on the spot because with any pq it actually in the prospect's mind seems far riskier to stay in the status quo and do nothing compared to actually finding the money to purchase and actually solve their problem. Like they look at where they're at right now and they're like, whoa, that is way too risky for me to stay where I'm at right now. I have to do something. I have to go out and find the money. I have to change my situation. Your questions help them feel that it's far riskier to stay where they're at. 
Most salespeople don't know how to do that. So their price seems up here and the problem doesn't look that bad to the prospect's eyes. With NPQ, price starts to move the other way and they're more focused on results-based thinking rather than price-based thinking. That's the difference. There also there is an element of signing up people on the first call rather than you following up 20 times, which yeah. is the saves you time in the long run if you want to make more money. And that's how, like, referring to Matt as well, because I know him personally, our income went from 45K to 100K, yeah. is when, okay, we're not wasting time to getting back to people. Yeah. But it's people trying to find the option of how they can do it. It's a totally different aspect. Yeah, when they're out there trying to find the funding and they're doing that on their own, you're not pushing them, they're actually pushing themselves to find the funding. That's when you know that you're really starting to learn NEPQ. You become what we call a legend. Marco, you are a legend. I love that. Now, I'm excited to announce Marco here for the last little while has been working with us. And he's actually our vice president of sales for the company. Somehow I NEPQ'd him to somehow get him over here to work with us because I wanted our students, our B2B clients, you know, our, our C to, you know, B2C clients, our, our people in our Facebook groups to really learn from some of the best people that I've ever trained. So I'm loving working with you, loving working with Matt, uh, loving work, lo loving to work with the team. Like, and it's really, I see the results from salespeople going through the training, not just from me training them, but from you guys training them as well. What's, what, let me ask you this. What's one question? I always ask this with any student we interview. What's one, and I feel like you're not even a student now since we're working together, but you're still, you're, I don't know, man. But okay, so what's one question you ask your prospects, like, you know, in business coaching or whatever it was you sold before you came here that would help build urgency for them to do it now and not months down the road? Prior? Yeah. Pri prior was tough. That, okay. that was the problem. That, okay. that building urgency prior to NPQ was tough. That's mm -hmm. why you rely on objection handling. Though yeah. doing NPQ totally changed that. Totally, totally changed that. Yeah, what's an NPQ question you use to help build urgency for them to take action to solve their problems now, rather than staying in the status quo for the next six months and keep losing money they could be making? True main question is the impact of that problem on them which makes them see the conversation a different perspective and the consequence question. Yeah. What would be the ramification of you staying the same? Yeah. You keep going on in that problem. That yeah. is what changed that. When you're talking about the level, the money, that is what the, when it goes up and this goes down. Yeah. Because you're, you're talking about, so what, what are the possible ramifications if you don't do anything about this? What changes for you? And when they start to think that way, they start to think, like we talked about, that it's far more riskier to stay in the status quo and do nothing because exactly. that changes. Whereas they could find the funding to solve their problem and actually be exactly where they want to be. It's possible for them. All they have to do is find the funding for it. Exactly. And there is the aspect of challenge people with tonality when you go like, possibly time to change, I guess. Yeah. But you're not, you're not assuming. Yeah. You're adjusting, you're being skeptical, and you're challenging. Yeah. It's a, it's like a light challenge, right? It's like we're we're like a velvet sledgehammer. We're not a sledgehammer like the old school stuff like that. That just triggers sales resistance, not helping people. Sales is collaborative. It's not adversarial. It's not you against the prospect. If you're reading books and listening to sales trainers that talk about you getting your money, and that you got to manipulate your prospects to do what you want them to do, you're never going to make more money than you are now. I can promise you are. You'll be capped wherever you're at now, and it'll get worse because today's consumers are far more skeptical. They're far more cautious. They're an information age buyer, and it will keep getting harder and harder for you to sell doing it that way. You have to learn how to ask the right questions at the right time in that conversation with the right tonality pausing that get them to persuade themselves that they want to change their situation and they want to do that with you. And that's when they start chasing you down rather than you chasing after them. Exactly right. My friend, you have, uh, you have become, you have legendary status 
you know, for, for our salespeople to go through our inner circle training program and they reach like certain income levels, just so everybody knows, we actually give them like a polo shirt. Marco's about to get his that says hashtag. I think it says be a legend or I am legend, something like that. And then what does it have? We put something on the back too. What was it? Uh, not sure, but it's be a legend is on the front. Yeah. Be a legend is on the front. Hashtag be a legend. So when you get to like certain income levels, once you go through like our advanced training, you get like this nice polo shirt, hashtag be a legend, and you get to wear it on all your sales calls. I love yeah. it. <laughs> all right. What's your advice for, okay. So any last words, any, any advice for our listeners out there today with what they sell? Like how do they get to the next level? Exactly. The, the advice I can give to someone is, uh, Really, if you want to be the under K guy, mm -hmm. realize one thing. It's be what you're doing right now, what are the chances that you get in there? Yeah. Be real with that kind of question because your ego sometimes stops you. Yeah. And, and if you are not sure, that see something else. Learn, embrace something difficult, something different, which is a more uh, science-based approach. Yeah. Don't do things because other people told you to do things. Own yeah. the on the structure. The other thing is I wanted to say is thanks to Jeremy because apart from everything, this totally changed my life. And that's for real. That totally changed my life, the life I met, the life whatever. So I really, really appreciate it. Well, that. you know, I, I love my students, especially the ones I get to work with uh, more on the one-on-one -on -one in our advanced program. It's almost like you guys, uh, I don't, I'm not old enough for you guys to be my kids. You know, I've just kind of hit that 40-ish range, but it's almost like you guys are like my brothers, you know, like you're my brothers, you're my sisters. And like, I take you underneath my wing and I love to see how you guys grow and just the things you accomplish once you learn the right communication skills. Like you said, you know, uh, something that changed my life, uh, when I was a 22 year old kid, I, I, my first job was selling security systems door to door. The sales manager dropped us off, you know, said, go make some sales. I had a script. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. He gave us some of these old school books. I think I was reading like Tom Hopkins, like selling to be a millionaire, like just old school, like crazy stuff, you know? And I tried to knock on the door and most people would like slam the door, slam the slam the door, straight commission job. And I remember after about seven or eight weeks of like nonstop rejection, like I'd work 12 hours a day and I might make $200 a week, like legitly, like this is six days a week. OK, I would have been better off like working at McDonald's, like no joke. And so I remember like one night sitting on the curb. And this is how NEPQ started. So everybody knows. I don't know if you probably you probably never even heard the story. But I remember like sitting on the curb after about seven or eight weeks of all this crap. And I just remember like my body was aching. I'd like knocked on doors all day and my legs. I mean, you went door to door. You know, it's my legs were like exhausted. And like I still remember like rubbing my shoes into like the hot concrete and how it felt and like my back and my chest was just drenched with sweat i had made zero sales that day zero sales for that week i'd made zero dollars literally if i would have picked up if i would have went to like a a wishing well and picked up pennies i would have made more money than what i made that week like no joke and i remember thinking like oh crap i just got married uh, my wife at the time was uh, I think we just had her. Yeah, we just had our my first daughter, Cami. Okay, we and we got divorced about ten years ago. And I'm remarried now and everything. But my daughter Cami was like six months old, something like that. I was just college kid, like freaked out, like I've got to provide for my family now. And I remember thinking, like, I don't have enough money to pay the rent in a couple of weeks. And I just got married, and I have this little, I have this little girl. Like, I'm gonna have to ask my in laws if we can move in with them. I was like, I was that embarrassed. And I'm like, you know, maybe selling, maybe selling just wasn't for me, like legitly. So I want everybody to know, like where Marco started, where I started, where some of our top students started, Matt started, was at the very bottom. Not like we just started off crushing it or anything. Cause you have to learn the right skills. Yeah. And I remember the sales manager picked me up that night, no sales, he's all disappointed. And he popped in a Tony Robbins CD, back when CDs were the thing. And Tony Robbins said something like this. I might be butchering it, but Tony said, most people fail for the simple reason that they don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed. They don't learn the right skills. He actually goes on to say that everybody's taught skills, but the people who fail 
are the ones who were not taught the right ones. And so it was like a, a light bulb went off on my head that maybe, just maybe what the company was training me and what these these sales gurus and these books I was buying, maybe they just weren't the right skills. Maybe they've just outdated and didn't work very well. Because that's the first time I really thought about that. And at that point in my mind, I said, look, I have to commit to learning how to do this the right way. You know, at the same time I was in college, my major was behavioral science, human psychology, and I was learning from my professors and all these books on the human brain and human behavior that the most persuasive way to communicate was over here. And it was all theory though, right? And it made sense. But all the gurus I was reading from in these books, they were teaching something completely different over here. So I'm like, who do I believe? Like, and so that's when I decided to start taking human behavior, what I was learning from these professors and all these psychologists and books and so really Socrates as well, Jesus Christ himself. And I put that into sales. And that's where NEPQ started to become developed. That was in the summer of 2000. That is the beginning of NEPQ. I'm, I'm not kidding you. And Thank so you. That, that next summer, you know, I made like $150,000 in income in four months. I became the number one salesperson in my company. And I was like 23 years old. And this was like outselling people that were 50, 55, 60. They've been in the company for 15, 20 years. And it wasn't because I was working hard. I was working less, but I knew what questions to ask when they opened the door that caused them to want to engage with me. And selling became so easy. It became like, it became like riding a bike. It was like something simple. Right. And so then as I transitioned into other industries, because I eventually got up to making about 700,000 a year doing that door to door. <laughs> OK, how many door to door salespeople, you know, that make seven, eight hundred thousand a year that only work about six months out of the year? Exactly. And so then I started to like, I need to expand. I needed to get to bigger industries, like bigger sales, because that was like more of a transactional sale. But the, the thing is, Mark, I'm like you. I'm like, I need to keep learning. So I kept adjusting the questions. I kept redoing them. And I noticed that there were certain questions I would use that would trigger sales resistance. So I had to tweak those and I had to get rid of those, right? And I had to redo them. And I would, I would watch every facial expression that people would give me when I was talking to them or how they reacted when I said this or I asked that. And that's where really any PQ started to get perfected. You know, in 2008, when the stock market crashed, you know, especially here in the States, 2009, that year, my income went from 780,000 in commissions to 1.3 million, almost wow. doubled while salespeople in my company, literally half of them lost their job and the rest of them, like their incomes got slashed in half. Like we had salespeople that were making 50, 60,000 a year. And I was making that like every two weeks and people are like, what the hell are you doing? I was calling the same amount of leads, but it was, it was the start of NEPQ. And, and back then this was like 2008, 2009. It was like maybe half of what it is today. 2012, kept learning, kept growing, kept learning, right? I used my car as University of Wills. And that year, 2.4 million commissions. 2011, same thing, 2012, 14, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way up to we start in seventh level. But you're right, it's all about learning the right skills and exactly. still learning. I still learn today. Exactly, right? It's just really doing the right things, having the right structure, the right process. Yeah, it's learning the right skills. Hey, I just, I, I just had to blabber that. I don't know. I never talk that much, but I'm usually the one asking the questions, so I felt like I needed to talk. So, Marco, and if you works, if you start talking, <laughs> there's my story. I think a lot of you might not have ever heard of my story. So, it's Marco. You're a legend. Thanks for being on here. I've been waiting for this interview. Like, I even talked to you about six, seven, eight weeks. So I'm like, man, we need to have you come out sometime. But I want to wait. I want to wait for a little bit, like, you know, get the group a little bit bigger and then we're going to bring you out here. OK, Marco, I'm going to go to bed because it's about nine o'clock here. Well, not so. I'm going to go hang out in the living room here for a couple of hours and saw some logs. I will see you tomorrow. Everybody else, thanks for being on. I hope you got some value. I sure learned a lot from you, Marco, so I appreciate you. Hey guys, if you enjoy these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below, join us, and we're gonna help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.